大家晚上好，欢迎大家来到国际培训大咖五十谈，我是主持人顾立民。上一期我们非常荣幸的请到了我们非常著名的啊 ，Dr. j e n n y Anderson 啊，呃，再重来一遍。OK， three two one， 大家晚上好。欢迎大家来到国际培训大咖五十谈，我是顾立民。上一期我们又非常荣幸的请到了著名的课程设计及绩效改进方面的专家 Dr. j e n n y Anderson 教授，与我们分享了教学系统设计、电子化学习及绩效改进方面的话题，并且谈到了组织变革与培训的关系，组织变革如何做到等等。同时呢，我们也邀请了我们五十团五十谈制作团队当中的核心成员之一。长隆集团的培训副总监陈万忠先生，也就是 Mr. Joseph Tan， 作为代表呢，向 Anderson 教授呢提出了工作平常工作当中遇到了一些问题，这种互动的形式呢，也受到了大家的喜欢。Mr. 呃、uh, ，Professor Anderson，Thank you so much 啊 ，Anderson 教授，感谢您多年来在本行业为本行业做出的贡献，同时呢。安德森教授呢，也是我在美国读研究生的时候的教授之一，感谢他多年以来的教诲。希望我们以后更加多的交流。那么今天晚上第二十六期，我们又一次非常非常荣幸的请到了另外一位非常重量级的嘉宾，他的名字呢叫马西瑞斯科尔教授 d r Marcy Driscoll。Dr. Marcy Driscoll， 他不仅啊，他在教学系统设计以及特别是教育心理学领域呢，都是一位非常重要的人物。那么他最为广为人知呢，是担任啊，在我们这个领域顶尖的学校之一的佛罗里达州立大学的教育学院院长，长达十三年的时间。两三年前呢，刚刚荣誉退休。在他的领导下呢，教育学院。继续传承了本领域大师们的这些经典的成就，使教育学院成为美国乃至全世界在该领域研究和实践的重镇之一。其中呢 ，Dr. Driscoll 啊 r i s k e r 教授，他的贡献呢功不可没。所以呢，本周的访谈当中呢，我们将向 r i s k e r 教授请教教学系统设计的跨行业及社会化的本质，以及在乌克时代。如何培养综合性的人才，以及他是如何将教育学院啊打造成为这样的重镇的，等等，他都经历了什么等等。所以，我们下面就有请 Dr. Marcy Driscoll r i s k e r 教授。Hi. Hi. Hi, Dr. Driscoll. How are you? I'm I'm well, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, just uh, address you by uh, by your first name, if if that okay,、uh, Marcy. Yes, please. Thank you, thank you for accepting our interview, and this is the probably the closest、uh, that we can get during the pandemic. Yes, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> and we're so lucky to travel, but、uh, unfortunately, that's not in the cards right now. You bet, you bet. Thank you to be on our show, and、uh, we have a lot of. Questions prepared, and、uh, we look forward to hearing from you to answer some of our questions. So, but first of all, just for our audience, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us where you grew up, where you went to college, what you studied, and where you live and study now. Sure. Yeah, happy to do that.、Um, I grew up in the Northeast,、um, actually on one of the Great Lakes,、uh, the Great Lake of Ontario.、Uh, I grew up in a, a town called, called Rochester. But it was something I wanted to leave because there's just not enough sun in that particular location. Lots of snow, lots of cloudy weather.、Uh, so I went to Massachusetts for my for virtually all of my higher education. I went to a women's college, Mount Holyoke, for my undergraduate degree in、uh, from '69 to '73.、Uh, Mount Holyoke is one of seven、uh, of the top. Women's colleges in the country. They're known as the Seven Sisters.、Um, some of your your audience might know that. And it's in Western Massachusetts. And I was a psychology major, but I also minored in English.、Um, that was 
I kind of wanted to be an English major, but I really didn't want to take things in the order that they wanted me to. So I decided psychology was a better fit. And I wanted to know about learning. So that's where psychology was, was a good fit for me. And then for my graduate work, I went just eight miles down the road to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, it's in a five college area. And while I was working on my senior thesis, uh, I had invited a faculty member from UMass to serve on my committee. And he subsequently became my doctoral advisor. We got to know each other and he invited me to join his team, his uh, research team at UMass. So I, I started in UMass at, in 73, finished my master's in educational psychology in 76 and my PhD in 78. Um, what's interesting about my program is that it was a traditional research oriented doctoral program, predominantly in psychology, educational psychology. I did a lot of work in cognitive psychology and in linguistics, simply because it, those are my interests and it was there. But I also, during my doctoral program, was interested in kind of what, what can we do with what we're learning? It was, mm -hmm. most of what I was studying was very basic research. And the work that I was doing for, uh, I worked for a cognitive psychologist, I worked for an educational psychologist, and, we were doing things like reaction time studies and very basic cognitive research. And my interest was in, well, how do we use that to make instruction more effective or more efficient? How do we, what does it mean? I mean, if you get a, a very small but significant difference between your research, how do you translate that into practice? How do, how do you make it work? Mm -hmm. So on my own, I learned about instructional design. Uh, I found out about the work that was going on at, at uh, FSU predominantly because they were sort of the early pioneers in the field. And so I, I read all of that entirely on my own. And that's what I thought I wanted to do. I wanted to, I wanted to be an instructional designer. So when I finished my degree, I, moved, I actually worked um, overseas in Iran for almost two years um, before the revolution. And when the revolution started, then we were, the, our team was asked to, asked to leave. And uh, I came back to the States and worked for a company in Massachusetts. And while I was working for this company in Massachusetts, doing predominantly program evaluation at that time, uh, I got a call from a friend who is an FSU graduate who said, FSU has a position and they don't know it yet, but they are looking for you. So, so I was like, okay, I'm now ready. I, I didn't think I wanted to be uh, a faculty member, but by that time, three years out, I was ready to, to go back into academia. And, um, and this, my friend was right. I interviewed and um, I and my very best friend in the world at the time were the finalists in the position. And I was, uh, I was the one hired. So I've been at Florida State um, since 1980 with one year, 92, 93, I was at Arizona State uh, for a year. And, but the rest of my career has been done here. And um, it's been a good career. I, am, I uh, eventually went into administration. So did a stint as department chair and then associate dean and then became dean of the College of Education at FSU in 2005. And then in 2018, decided to retire. So I have I retired in December of 2018, but was still working on a on a book, and so that's been that's been my focus for the last well almost two years now. Uh, so I got to figure out retirement. That's that's what I'll do for the next little bit. <laughs> so you are now fully retired. I am. Yes. And uh, so uh, Marcy is is uh, such a great I mean uh, put on track of record. Uh, that you have been at, F at FSU for 38 years and you have been dean uh, for the College of Education yes. for 13 years and you ret retired in, well, two years ago in 2018, if I'm correct. Yes. And uh, you have graduated like, like 10,700 graduate students. <laughs> Since... Quite a lot, yes. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> and also, you have uh, you have advised forty two 
you have incubated uh, 42 doctoral graduates, PhDs uh, under your wings. Yes. So that's, that's remarkable. That's really remarkable. And uh, so it is, it is such an achievement. And you have been teaching and conducting research, numerous articles and chapters and uh, including books. And one of the books is called uh, the, Psychology, the Psychology of Learning for Instruction. And can you tell us a little bit about that book? Sure. Uh, what, what's that book about? Uh, actually, that's the book that I just finished, the fourth edition. Uh, the, yeah, the, the third edition was published in 2005. And uh, the publisher, of course, had wanted me to update it between then and now. But being a, a full-time dean, I just simply didn't have the time or the energy to do it. So that was my goal when I retired, was to work on the book. And so essentially it, it, it is as it sounds, it's a, it's a compilation of learning theories that, um, that essentially these are, these, it's some historical, but largely uh, work that's being done now on um, how learning occurs and then what can we do with that knowledge about how learning happens to make instruction. Um, because my focus has always been, um, how, what do we really need to know about learning theory to be, to, to, to use it in practice? Whether the practice is uh, teaching, designing instruction, um, being a manager, working in virtually any professional area where learning happens, my goal has, has been, what do we need to know Right. What does any professional need to know about learning to uh, to be effective in practice? And so that's so what so this particular um, edition of the book um, it updates a lot of the research on, on learning for the last what fifteen years since the last edition, but we've added. I, I took on a co-author who is a, one of my former doctoral students actually, who is mm -hmm. a, a faculty member at FSU, and. Um, uh, we we really thought through kind of there's enough there's enough work that's been done in instruction and instructional theory that it made sense to include some chapters on that are specifically applications rather than just uh, learning theory per se. So for every two theory oriented chapters, we've inserted an applications chapter that really looks into some of the instructional theory that has come out of those learning theories um, that were previous, previously described. So throughout the book, the focus is really on application and what do these theories look like in practice. Um, but it, it kind of runs from, um, well, we, I maintain sort of three basic perspectives, behavioral perspective, cognitive perspective, situative perspective. Um, mm -hmm. So in a, a lot of our literature, even in instructional design literature, the primary contrast has been behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism. But mm -hmm. it seemed to us that when you look at it, constructivism is cognitive and its, it's focus is still on the individual where when we have to consider what happens to um, in, in the sense of a sort of social learning, that's where the situative perspective comes into play. It's, it's looking at learning in the context of social, historical, political variety, variety of contexts that it doesn't happen except within, a, within one of those contexts. So that's, the, that's sort of the three contrasting perspectives that we use throughout the book. So, so probably a long-winded answer. <laughs> Yeah, so psychology, uh, cognitive and, uh, and, uh, and situations, right? Right. 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 So, okay, great. That's, that's, I think that's what a, should, what a book should be. I mean, uh, you would use uh, applications and uh, because nowadays and people are kind of a, have very quick turnaround and uh, some of the fundamental theories, they must demonstrate their values and uh, they're, I, I bet you have a, tons of gazillions of, uh, of uh, business cases and examples. And you, so you have been in the instructional design field for so long. Uh, by the way, you are the sixth uh, professor that I have interviewed and the previous ones that preceding you are uh, Dr. The, the honorary Dr. Uh, Roger Kaufman and then Dr. Bob Branson, the 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then Dr. John Keller, Dr. Bob Reeser, and Dr. Uh, Jim Klein. Yes. And you are the sixth uh, professor. I'm so glad that I have um, so many great names to be on this series for our Chinese audiences and also other audiences in development countries. Because uh, Florida State, FSU, the College of, of, of Ad, uh, the Instructional system, system Design and Learning Systems Program is one of the epic centers in the world, or one of the most important uh, uh, think tank, and uh, in theory, in both theory and application. So you have been in the leadership and in the forefront of, lead, uh, I mean, in the administration and also in the forefront of research. So uh, what do you think that will help define the field of instructional, de- instructional design in the future? Because there's so many uh, dynamics going on so far. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good question. And um, it is interesting to, to kind of look at the history of our program to, to, to really sort of see how the field has uh, progressed. And I would say that um, it's one of the absolute foundational sets of principles for the field is going to be one of the things that's going to be critical for the future. And that's the systems perspective, um, mm-hmm. which, which in my mind actually is very consistent with the situative view of learning because the systems perspective requires you to look at um, to look at, at learning and performance in a syst- within a system so that if something happens over here or you change something over here something somewhere some other part of the system will be affected everything kind of works in concert and I think that's been one of the values of, of the people that, many of the people that you talk to, I think Roger Coffin's a good example. I mean, he's one of those who has emphasized the mega view in addition to just the micro view. And I think that's a, that's a criti- critical aspect. So I think that's one of the things going forward that will continue to define our field. I don't think that's gonna go away. Mm-hmm. We're starting to see, or we have already seen, I think, uh, um, more interdisciplinary views coming into play. Learning sciences, I think, is the other big one that, you know, we've seen, for example, in, at, um, at Indiana, University of Indiana, Indiana University, their program kind of has shifted to, uh, to learning sciences as opposed to traditional instructional design. And um, our program has sort of done that a little bit, and they've kind of said we have we have two major thrusts. One is more traditional instructional design performance improvement, and the other is sort of this learning sciences orientation, which is why they changed the name to instructional systems and learning technologies. Uh, so I think that's something that we'll see. The other, you know, frankly, uh, I think this was unplanned for, but I we were headed in this direction anyway, and that's the the whole online space. I think that you know, we'll, we, we are, our field more than any is prepared to work in the online environment. Uh, and that was a direction most universities are going, they're, they're fielding more classes online than they ever used to. Businesses and industry, they're doing the same thing. We sort of own that space, I think, um, more so, because we know how to make learning effective and how to create effective instructional learning environments in the online space. So I think that's an, another, uh, direction that's that's already here in essence. Um, um, I mm-hmm. I hope that you know I hope that we will continue to be interdisciplinary. That's a that's mm-hmm. a I mean that's always been I think a um, a characteristic of of our field, and I think it will continue to be, uh, frankly. And when I interviewed Bob Reeser, he he told me that uh, well he had that book you know the instructional system uh, the instructional design and technology and then as as you just mentioned we also covered that topic too uh, so the, so with or the, my question is so with or without the pandemic well you have you have already started the research and you know shifting the gears maybe shifting the focus a little bit from here and there and then to catch up the trend of the society of the of of the economic development so um so that's 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 something that i really commend that 
that what you have done as one of the epic center because of research center as a think tank you have to think ahead of the the mass you know yes. Yes. you have to be leading and then kind of uh, tell them where to go so so uh and 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 you just mentioned that the word interdisciplinary and i do have a question on that so why do you think that isd should be moving into more dis interdisciplinary in the future um i think largely because when i look at research on learning for example it it's a complex enterprise and i don't i it, it seems to me that that the kinds of problems that we will continue to need to solve whether it's in learning or it's instructional design are complex enough that a single perspective is not going to get us to the answer we're seeing a lot more what i would call big science um, mm -hmm. now the, the hard sciences have done this for forever i mean you see very large research teams for example working on problems mm -hmm. Um, we're seeing it more and more in areas of psychology, again, where, where you got people with multiple perspectives working on a single problem. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that, that if we look at the sorts of problems that face us in our society today, that again, it's go, to solve them adequately is going to require people coming from different points of view, different perspectives, different knowledge, working together. I don't think a single field is going to be able to do that on its mm -hmm. own. And um, I, I, keep, I keep getting reminded of um, uh, a biologist, E.O. Wilson, um, who wrote a, um, a lovely book called Consilience. And the, the idea behind Consilience was bringing multiple perspectives together in, this, in the solution of very complex problems. And the way he illustrated it, and I adopted it actually in my book, it's sort of fresh in my mind, um, is if you kind of, if you sort of put a quadrant, you know, you've got, um, and, you t and you say, okay, in each quadrant is a different field. So let's put neuroscience, instructional design, educational psychology, sociology, okay? And then you look at, let's say you, you overlay that with concentric circles. If you have a big circle and you're, and, the, and you put problems along that circle, then if it's a big circle, then yeah, you're working on a problem that's probably in a single quadrant. But the closer you get to the center, mm -hmm. if you have a concentric circle, the tighter that circle gets, the mm -hmm. more you end up, and that's the definition of a complex problem, that's what he said, then the more it requires the intersection of multiple fields. And I believe that. I think that's that's um, that's something we cannot overlook. And I, I I think about our public schools as another example. F folks in instructional design haven't done a, <clears throat> a lot of work in a, in public schools. We have a lot of issues in schools that need to be solved. But we're not going to go in there and be you know the saviors. We have to do it in concert with teachers with. Um, teacher educators with uh, other folks that that work in schools so it just seems to me that that's it's going to be a requirement to have an interdisciplinary mm -hmm. view and and the mm -hmm. ability to work with people who don't see the world the same way you do that's that's a great explanation uh, can you tell me the the author of that book again um, <clears throat> it's, uh, e capital e capital o Wilson Okay, Yo Wilson. Okay, Yo Wilson. It's called Consilience. It's a it's a few years old. I want to say it's probably well more than a few. Maybe it may be uh, fifteen more than fifteen years old now. But he was he's a um, an evolutionary biologist, and mm -hmm. um, I just I found a lot of insights in that book. Um, it, it it did absolutely affect my way of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. When I was when I was reading it, yes, it is it is a it is a world of pluralism and also world of diversity and it's going that way and we're already in the in in that world actually so uh, as the economy develops especially the internet that kind of a you know it's a it's the internet is like a naughty kid <laughs> naughty kid. It interrupts everything, messes up everything. And uh, especially in China, we have a, a national strategy called the Internet Plus. 
-hmm. And then that, that little plus sign yeah. drove the economy up enormously and, and also drove a lot of people crazy because that's you, you kind of un, a lot of uh, invisible or untangible forces have been unleashed and then created so many unforeseen uh, opportunities. Right. And then so many, you know, uh, collusion of uh, opportunity, so many passes, and then there are so many um, uh, uh, sparkles. So, and then, and then that's, that's how the, the society got more kind of uh, active and then they, 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 they proceed, they progress. So I, I do, uh, I, I, I do believe that, but in the past, because we don't have that internet technology and your information is kind of a, downstream that so we, we went very deep in, in each one of the uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. And now is, it needs more kind of cross-functional, interdisciplinary, and in management, there are also network kind of a management, you know, parallel management. They're all kind of a moving to that way. So from every, each one of all those fields, and then we see the trend that way. And uh, so you, you also just mentioned technology, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because with or without pandemic, you already, I mean, FSU as a whole, you have already moved into the research, the advanced research of that. And with the pandemic, the pandemic has forced mo all, almost all of the business online because there's no other way to go. So in the beginning of the year with the outbreak, and uh, now, my question to you is, will everything go online work? I mean, especially learning development. How would, you know, online, we talk about o O2O. Now, we, last night, we cut off friends, we talk about OMO, online merging online, offline, you know, all those. So, so tell, give us a little bit, you know, clearer picture, please. Well, I don't know that I have the clearer picture, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, um, yeah, I, I think, um, I think a lot of things, as you say, most everything at this point has, has moved online. And I, but I am not 100% confident that everything works online. <clears throat> I mean, I think that we, there is still the, as much as, you know, we can interact and have a relationship and whatnot, there is still something to be gained in face-to-face -face interactions that, that I think can get lost um, online. The other thing that I worry about more, which is not so much the, 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 um, the affordances of the technology, but the fact that not everyone has the same access. Um, when you look even in the United States, which is a relatively well-off country, um, even in my own city, we've got children that are trying to do remote learning that, do, that don't have stable access to the internet. And, and you see the same thing in the aging population where um, they're calling it now the gray digital divide where people right. don't have the, either they don't have the access, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the, the means to, um, to use the, the, the affordance of the technology to the extent that it's, that it's that's possible. Now, I mean, I think about even my own family, I have elderly parents that we, we get together uh, in a Zoom call um, every Friday afternoon. Um, and it's great, but it's, it's not the same. Obviously, I, we're missing uh, some of the human element and not being able to see them in face to face. So yeah, you, have all, you also have other kinds of, of other skills that, um, that I think, I was just thinking of performance skills and, you know, learning to play music and it, Zoom's not such a great um, <laughs> way to do that. Uh, it, it's, so I, so I, I'm not entirely convinced that we can do everything online uh, at this point, but at the moment we don't have a whole lot of choice. Um, so I don't know. No, I don't have right. a good answer to your question. I, I think you answered it perfectly. I do agree with you, by the way. Um, I also have the same view that uh, not everything go online because uh, 20 years ago when I, when I, when I was at uh, the Bell Company at US West, we started to learn, I mean, to apply e-learning. At that time, we called the data farm. <laughs> and then, then later I called LMS and the LCMS, but we called it data farm. That was because 
that was before LMS was named. Yeah. And uh, so we suddenly, because we cover you know, the ent entire continental United States, so we have call centers everywhere. So every overnight, so kind of, uh, you know, we have that. Right. Everybody, everything goes online, every course goes online. And then there's a phenomenon called the uh, giggle, the garbage in, garbage out. Yep. <clears throat> and then there's no interactivity. And then we struggled about that. We thought, well, going online, e-learning is definitely the, one of the most efficient way. And e-learning is the future. But how do we conquer that interactivity? And so we have many other measures, countermeasures, actually. You know, we have a support. At that time, not kind of personal computer. Well, there is a personal computer, but with a computer lab in the classroom. And then we have an instructor on site, you know, walk around in the back and you know, support anybody, raise their hand, you have a question, so that we can answer right away. Right. So that's kind of assisted learning. And um, so, so I do agree with you, uh, especially nowadays is, um, last night we talked about this with uh, several key uh, corporate university heads here in Shanghai. So we went out for dinner, we could talk about it, and we, 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 we had the same view. And I, and I said uh, two reasons. One is, 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 is against the human nature because human is a group animal and uh, we learn from each other, from interactivity. Exactly. you know, from you, uh, not from a flat screen. So right. the second one is because uh, inter nowadays the technology is not advanced enough for us to have all kinds of interactivities to, to help us, you know, uh, to help us, what's it called, to in for the process of encoding from short memory to long-term memory yet. So that kind of a, so our, our software, our technology is not, that advanced yet. Yeah. So I, I, I told them, I don't want to see your company putting everything online and then paying the price again. Right. So that's, so, so I, I do agree with you. Um, but, but how, but, and then extended question is how would do, how much would you think uh, instructional design will embrace technology in the future? Oh, I think it will continue to embrace technology. I, I don't see that going away. Um, what I would, what what it will be interesting to see, and what uh, some of the conversations that I've had with some colleagues is, I would sort of like to see us uh, drive the technology as opposed to the technology driving us, to where we're the ones that understand learning and the, and the problems of learning and what what's needed in learning. So we should be the ones kind of saying, here's the technology that we need to be able to do our jobs better. Right. So rather than because because one of the things that I see in this, you can see this with students a lot, you know, some new some new technology, a new program, a new gadget and whatever it is, is gets out there because, you know, companies are always developing new stuff. And you know, so you get the latest, greatest gizmo. And then so so students will say, well, what can I use it for? Right. Can I you know, let's take it and let's see if I see if I employ it in a classroom or if I employ it online or if I employ, let's see what happens, right? Well, okay, that's one way of, of looking at it, the impact of technology on learning. But let's flip it around and say, rather than waiting for the gizmos to get out there, what, what, what do we need? What kinds of capabilities will in fact make learning more effective, will improve it, will um, enhance it? let us sort of drive that conversation to a, to a greater extent than perhaps we have been doing so. Um, I mean, I worry about, I mean, this is a, a little bit different um, issue, I think, but I see some, some of my colleagues, um, one of my colleagues, two of my colleagues in particular, are doing really, really interesting work on, on games and how learning games can influence um, thinking and learning as the students engage in the game. Well, and they're doing some really good work, but how, did, how now does that get out into classrooms and, and how do teachers learn about what, what's effective and what's not effective? There is a lot of stuff that's on YouTube, for example, that teachers are, are employing in their classrooms that has no evidence behind it whatsoever as terms of whether it's effective. But somebody tried it, they put it out there, and, and teachers get access to it. The stuff that actually has evidence behind it 
It's not in the public sphere. So that's a problem we have to solve, I think, um, at some point in terms of how do we get the knowledge out there. But, but I, yeah, I think, I think um, we're not going to give up on technology. I think, I think the field's going to continue to embrace it. Um, but I, I don't want us to forget our roots either in terms of the, the, the basic systems and systematic thinking that, that goes into it. <clears throat> Absolutely. Sy uh, system thinking is kind of the underlying, you know, kind yeah. of underlying uh, what would I call logic of it, of all the, the work that we we're doing. And, and, and I do agree that I, I really like the, the idea, uh, your idea of telling the technology what to do yeah, right. <laughs> instead of they tell us what to do. Right. You know, we are the experts in learning and instruction. So, and, and I think we had a good try in AR, you know, VR, augmented reality, virtual reality. But that, those, that was a good try because that was too expensive. And now it's not popular anymore, especially here in China. I don't know about America, but um, uh, it was popular for a while. Yeah, it was here too. But not, mm -hmm. it wasn't very widely used, but it, it was popular in the universities for a little while. Uh, people were trying things out, um, but it never, it never really got too far. Right, but uh, but technology, like it or not, will be in our lives and you know merged into our lives seamlessly in the future, whether so. we like it or not. Yeah. And uh, I had a prediction that probably future like learning is not needed, and maybe we have like a new Robocop. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's not half man, half machine, and then you want a long term memory. Here's the five T just download five gig or just download a gigabyte, just download it. So yeah. training is not, I mean, we're, we're probably, uh, I, I, I mean, probably next generations, they can, they, they will see it and use it in their lives. But, but um, yeah, fundamental theories and how the human brain works still, I mean, that's the bottom line of the, I mean, the uh, fundamentals of uh, say, psychology. And uh, you also, also one of your works is on social view of learning. I want to, mentioned that as well how how do you can you explain that to us and how it is different is it different from social learning no, no it's i mean that's really what i what I'm, what I'm talking about it's the the notion again that that learning takes place in a socio-historical political context and um and that we can't ignore those things and i guess it, it, when i look at the situative view and that's this is what i talk about in, in my book it it in a lot of the research on cognition, for example, yes, context is important. We say, you know, you got to consider the context, but it tends to be in the background where the, the social learning and situated perspective foregrounds the notion of the, the context where it's, it's, it, is a, it is a part of what um, determines learning. I mean, it's co-constitutive where the, the person in the context changes the context. So if you take the person out of the context, well, then it's not the same anymore. And so we've got to look at learning within the social context. But the other part of it, and this is something that I've, I've recently been uh, reading a lot about and finding quite fascinating, is we're starting to see evidence from neuroscience that reinforces and um, is consistent with the, the work that's happening in social learning theory, which is the notion that um, you know, emotion is a huge part of, of how and what we learn. And, um, and, that, and that's why the social context is so important because that's where our interactions with other people. Um, as you had mentioned earlier, we are social animals. And uh, that's a, that turns out to be absolutely critical for brain development. And if we don't, you know, if, if a child at, at, let's say, a very early age is deprived of social connections, they don't, de they don't develop uh, uh, properly. And so it, it's, it's something that, that, you know, we can't ignore. It's a, it's a, it's a part of, of, of learning. Um, so that's, that's kind of where, where my thinking has been lately. Right, right. And that's traced back to what we talk about, like technology, you know, doesn't replace, this, doesn't replace everything because there are societal, I mean, elements in it. So yes. those social factors is sometimes a place, sometimes play a very important role in, in individual learning process. 
absolutely, no question about it. And I think, mm -hmm. in fact, it's interesting. Um, I am, uh, even though I'm not teaching, I am mentoring a few students, not in a formal sense, but in an informal sense. And I have a high school student out in Washington State who has asked me to mentor her on a project. She's going to do a research project. Um, she, she goes to a STEM, STEM oriented high school. And so she found me and asked me if I would serve as a mentor. I'm like, sure, this sounds like fun. And yeah. what she's really interested in is the emotional impact of students going from in-person learning in classrooms to remote online because she experienced it. And she said she and her friends had such an emotional reaction. It's just not the same. And, and one of the reasons why um, when families were asked, are you gonna send your kids back to school when school reopens? They're like, yeah, my kids really wanna go back to school. They, for them, there was a huge kind of, um, I don't know, disconnection from from the things that are comfortable for them in their environment, their friends and their teachers and the in-person kind of thing. So she's, she's going to do a, it'll be a survey study, but uh, kind of looking at the emotional impact of moving from in-person to online classrooms and wants to then look at the relationship of that to how well students are learning. Um, and I, and I, I have no doubt in my mind, but what she's going to find some um, some 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 negative impacts where students are simply not as able to manage their own learning when they're in a remote setting when they've been forced to do it you know they haven't chosen it they they were forced into it and they had to make a very very rapid transition from in person to to remote uh, distance learning Wow, that's great. I mean, I look forward to your articles or book on the, on the results because that will have some, I mean, cross-cultural Im implications whatsoever. I mean, maybe, you know, it's useful to you back in Iran, uh, yeah. in China, in, in other countries, and there are any other cultures because families are, you know, I mean, every family is the same in the, in the world. If you look at, you know, a child's education and how to bring them up, you know, the difficult ages and everything, every family is the same, basically. So I really look forward to your research. Uh, what will, I mean, to what you have found, what you will find. Yeah, me too. It's, it'll be fun. I mean, that's what yeah. I think. I've, I've really enjoyed, you know, I've never worked with a high school student before, but this will be a lot of fun, I think. Right, right. This is really fun. It sounds, it sounds like really fun. I mean, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, so uh, what, you, you want, one of your uh, research uh, is also focusing on uh, comprehensive talents in the society. So we develop a, um, so uh, my question is right now, you know, in the, in the era of WUCA, right now is everything is so, you know, uh, volatile and uh, uncertain, you know, so uh, ambiguity. So in the era of WUCA, how should business train comprehensive talents today? Well, wow, that's a big question. I know that's a big question. The shorter it gets, the bigger the question is <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I completely agree. <laughs> um, and I don't know that I have the, uh, necessarily a good answer, but um, I would say that, that having opportunities for trainees to work in, um, to, to have um, problem solving kinds of situations where they can work on complex problems um, and be able to work them from different angles um, is something that would be essential because what you're really looking at as a as an outcome is what I would call flexible thinking where um, people are able to not just sort of take a single perspective and um, zoom in from from there but they have to be able to to say okay this is what this perspective gets me but if I adopt a different perspective what else can I learn what else that will help me solve this particular problem so that ability to to be, to be flexible in, in your thinking is the outcome I think that we're looking for. So the way to get at that, I believe, is through, um, through different kinds of, of um, sort of real life scenarios where you are engaged in complex problem solving sort of situations 
where you have opportunities to systematically um, learn a set of skills from a different perspective or point of view um, would be a potentially a way to do it. In, in business, I mean, part of it, it would seems, seems to me now, I don't have a lot of ex experience in business and what I do have is, a, is quite a long time ago. But when I look at when, it, as, as Dean, when I was had a lot of people that reported to me, it was pretty important that people were able to cross train so that you don't have a, a skill or competency area that only one person knows how to do. Um, that you, and, and it, I, I found it helped if somebody got training in an area that's not their primary area of responsibility, it did two things. One, it gave them some new skills, but two, it gave them the ability to see a problem from that other person's point of view. Because sometimes when you're locked into your own point of view, and you know you're maybe of an opposite you know you get kind of at loggerheads with somebody but if you have if you have walked in their shoes and you have learned some of their skills you have a better understanding of what they're facing and i found that that lends for better overall problem solving as a team when when people have that uh have that ability so that's kind of what i would would think would be important. Yes, it, it is, makes sense because it really heads back to what we just talked about, inter, uh, interdisciplinary, uh, exactly. cross-training, uh, social learning. So yeah. it, it's all, and it, it also uh, included in your book in the third part of the situated part, yes, right? exactly, yes. Yeah, so training comprehensive is, sounds like a big subject, but when, in reality, when you, when you do it, I mean, it's, uh, when you really count out the real learning for the real job, actually those keywords, I mean, keywords, I mean, elements of those key concepts are kind of a, you know, by default, they're built in. You have to do it that way. You have to do it, inter, uh, you have to do it, you know, interdisciplinary. You have to, you know, engage people in a social environment and uh, interact with other people. So that will promote your, or even accelerate because businesses are always looking for efficiency, accelerate yeah. the learning, individual learning process, because learning is not the purpose at all for business. They right. don't, they, they don't care actually right. in essence. I mean, in essence, of course we do, but in essence, business doesn't care how much individual know or what to do. They only care, can you do it? Give me the results or show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. By the way, you had mentioned um, earlier an assumption about business cases in my book. And, um, and I do want to, to mention that uh, my co-author and I were very, very deliberate in our choice of examples that we worked mm -hmm. throughout the book. And mm -hmm. because the, the book is used um, in high, higher education, in a variety of areas. Um, so in professional education, like engineering education, nursing education, mm -hmm. medical education, it's used there. It's also mm -hmm. used to some extent in teacher education. Of course, it, it's also used in instructional design and mm -hmm. in people who are in the business context. So we were very, very deliberate in choosing, and, I, and there's a, at the beginning of the book, there's a kind of a um, scenarios at a glance to show um, here are um, here are the three primary contexts, professional contexts, K-12, higher education, business and industry. And here are, here's what the, because we, each chapter has at least two scenarios that we work um, through. And so it shows which scenarios in which chapters have which focus. So it's, it's sort of a guide to, so that people have a, a good sense of, um, kind of how we have how we've developed the examples because i think it's important for people as they're learning these learning theories that they that they see what they look like in right. practice and that they can think about those kinds of things so anyway that was a, a, an aside but um i, I know yeah. but that's very nice structure i really like that format i mean i mean if you have you know k k-12 and all that you know in educational uh, situation and um, in the business world, all, all of them covered. That's that's very applicable. I mean, for very useful for the uh, for the readers. Um, so um, 
final question on the on the on the cluster of the <laughs> professional part. What is the uh, biggest? Well, you have educated, good educator, and. Uh, and so many people already said that, and everybody knows that you have been dedicating your your whole life, your entire career in in education. So, uh, you have trained so many instructional designers and uh, educators. So, what are the biggest challenges of ISD instructional system design education today, as you see it? Hmm. This is okay. a shorter question, so bigger, <laughs> bigger, so bigger, bigger answer. answer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Sorry about that, but no, we can. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges is, um, I mean, it, it's going to sound sort of trite to say this, but to be mm -hmm. relevant, um, because I, I just right. worry that people still. I mean, you mentioned um, before we started when you were telling me a little bit about your background that you right. didn't know anything about what instructional design was when you right. when you stumbled across. Nineties, yeah. And unfortunately, I, I think that's still true. Um, where you, we, we are not as well known as a field in some areas as we should be. Um, and I, I gave a, a talk recently to, um, to, to my own program and the, my dean, the new dean was on the call, was a Zoom call. And mm -hmm. one of his questions afterward is why, because I had made a comment about, or someone else on the call had made a comment about ISD not being that um, influential in teacher education, for example. Mm -hmm. And his, he, his question was, why? Why not? Well, they don't much get exposed to instructional systems design. And so th that's, that's one of the reasons why I've sort of pushed the notion of, of more interdisciplinary, but it's because we've got to get, we are so relevant right now to so many problems, but people don't necessarily know what we do or who we are. And that's a challenge. And I think we have to do more to get what we do out into the public sphere. However we do that, <laughs> we, we should. Well, Marcy, thank you for saying that because if, it is, if the United States of America is like that, think about China where we are today. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. and uh, we're, we're even, even not to that, to that, I mean, sometimes we call in business, this, there's a problem and sometimes there's a good problem, mm -hmm. you know, that is a good problem, uh, meaning you know the gap, you know that uh, we have the resources where, where we find, we need to find those resources, some resources to cope with it, to, yeah. to solve it. But sometimes we don't know, we don't know. Yes. That's right. You know, we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> and, and the reason I'm saying that, and the, also that's the reason of this program of the TMS training master series is to um, bring the master thinkers and gurus in this field to let people in China in the learning and development field know that training, I have a saying training is a science, mm -hmm. instruction is an art, and uh, one is objective, the other instruction is subjective. So instruction, I mean, training is a science, is psychology. And uh, so you have been teaching in this for so many, for several decades. And, uh, but in China, there's only like the normal universities are teaching relevant, you know, like course design, instructional technology, but very few of them are graduates move into business. That's why business needs so there are very few, I mean, very few. Um, so, so that's the reality, that's the reality. And in China, in education field, yeah, they learn, uh, they learn, but not as much as they should be exposed or their visibility is not as high as they should be. Yeah. That's probably similar to what the United States is today, but in the business world, no, there's no fully systematic trained uh, expertise instructional designers. Yeah. Um, all of ours are kind of a self-taught, well, except there are a few that of us, we were trained in the United, in the United States. We returned to China and we teach students. But yeah. think about how many companies, how many million, millions of companies or millions of uh, training professionals are there in China. And the instructional system design is one of the fundamental skills of every training professional should possess. 
Exactly. But so that's that that's that's the reality. That's the gap. So at least right now, I'm what I'm trying to do is trying to let people know we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. To know, we know. We don't know. And uh, and then we can do think about get together, think about it, and uh, do something about it. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Jim and I talk about uh, a lot about this and about about the program and his department and so on and so forth. And we will look, we, we always look for the future. But the Chinese economy is developing so fast. And uh, I mean, it's a train. It's like instructional system designs are like is 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 a guy like are holding the ticket and looking at the last train, the shadow <laughs> of the last train. Oh my God, I missed it again. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I think uh, I think you're right. Well, the need is absolutely there. I mean, I mean, um, either the program itself, or or either you know, in the future collaboration, or maybe joint certificate programs may be possible. You know, sure. and so that's 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 one of the directions that we're looking. We hope. So, anyway, um, so uh, so you have been, uh, Marcy, you have been the dean for like thirteen years. That's a big job. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really big job, and you have been called a trailblazer. I, I look to be honest with you. I must confess, I looked at your uh, retirement party online. So. Oh, <laughs> I wondered where you got some of the numbers. I was like, how do you find find that out? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a where to find your, the biggest, the, the best, best uh, occasion to summarize in your entire professional life: the retirement party. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so they called you trailblazer uh, by. Um, so there must be some professional breakthroughs uh, while you were um, 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 uh, um, leading the college of of education. So, can you give us a few examples? The reason I'm asking this question is um, we want uh, you know to learn something uh, because you I know that you must have your had your challenges at that time and what you did and maybe something uh, very valuable to us. Well, I think one of the ways that Trailblazer was, was being applied is the fact that um, if you look at my career, I've had a lot of firsts as a woman, a woman professional. When I came to Florida State, I was the first woman hired into the program. And wow. the first woman in the entire department. When I got there, it was 30 guys and me <laughs> in the department. <laughs> the program was about 12 people, I think, at the time, all guys. And it remained that way for quite some time before we hired another woman. So first woman in my program, first woman in my department, first, first, program, first woman program leader of my <clears throat> program, first woman department chair of my department, and first, and first woman dean, first and still only woman dean. You know, you know, for a college of education, to me, that was just remarkable that we hadn't had a female dean previously, because education in general has more women than men in it, but, um, and our college was no different, but I, I was the first woman dean and, and still the only woman dean. So I think that was one of the ways in which um, it was being used. But then I would say in terms of the college itself, uh, there are a number of, of things that I am proud of that um, under my watch that we were able to do. We, um, I established a, a, a communications office, which we'd never had before. I felt very much the same way about my college as I just expressed about instructional systems, which is rankings are a big deal in colleges. And I didn't feel like our ranking reflected our contributions to research and development and, and the field. And I, th and I, I believe that because I, felt like we weren't getting our story out there. We weren't telling it well enough. So if people don't know what you do, then how can they say you're better or than other, than other colleges? So I established, we, d we never had a, a communications office, nor did we have any sort of systematic communication coming out of the college. And so um, I felt that was, in, that was important. And so we established a, a communications office, began to get work out there, and now, um, you know, I'm, I'm 
I saw, interestingly saw, and it, I think a relatively immediate impact in the rise in our rankings. And so we went from way below 50 to now, I think the college is ranked like 37th out of colleges of education around the, around the nation. Um, so I, I think that was a, um, leading the way. We, we put more emphasis into graduate education. Mm -hmm. and previously, when, when I um, started as dean, we had two thirds of our students were undergraduate, one third graduate students. Now it's the other, it's, it's not quite two thirds, one third, but it's probably 55% graduate and 45% undergraduate. Um, and we did that relatively deliberately. Um, and that's partly because undergraduate majors are largely teacher education. Well, we're not the biggest university in Florida by any stretch. And so if you look around the state um, where, where teachers go, I mean, we're also in a city that's not a very large city. Uh, Tallahassee is what, 200 and some thousand people where the, the large producers of teachers were downstate. So Miami-Dade College, um, they're, there's, and they're huge, they're the biggest in the state. University of Tampa and you know, the big urban areas were the large producers of teachers. So it seemed to us that if we had a more boutique approach to teacher education where, where our teachers were coming out, not just with an undergraduate degree, but with a graduate degree as well, then they could move up the ladder in, uh, as leaders in their school systems. So we put much more emphasis in graduate education than we did in undergraduate. And that's a, that was a shift um, that occurred. Um, we had, uh, I mean, I guess this was an accomplishment. We, we fielded the first um, uh, graduate program online um, in, of course, it was in instructional systems that we actually did that when I was a department chair. And, uh, and now we have, our college has two online uh, doctor of education programs and that, and they were the first in the university to have a, a professional doctoral degree. Um, and one of them is in educational leadership and the other one is in instructional systems. And that one's new, the, the IS pro, uh, ISLT doctor or doctor of education is only so that's third year i think could be second year i'm not sure second or third year um the other one is probably in its fifth year at this point so those are a few areas that um wow yeah Great, great. So first of all, you set up the uh, communications office, which is so key. So the the major function of that communication office is to communicate to in inside the university or outside or both. Both, but both. I would say um, it's more important outside the university. Um, I felt like the between the between me and my associate deans, we were doing a good job of communicating inside the university because like Bob Reeser, for example, right, right. one of the things that he did in his, or he continues to do in his role is to make connections between our faculty and faculty in other colleges around the campus. Um, so a lot of the work that, um, that, that we're doing, I think is getting out inside the campus, but, um, but outside the university, that's, you know, we were a well-kept secret and uh, I felt like that was critical for us to, to get the word out about what, what we were doing and what, what we're all about. And over time, the, that office expanded to the point where it, it now has recruitment under its swing so that they are, they're also responsible for uh, working with the departments to recruit, to identify populations of students who would be interested in our programs and to, to work with them on recruitment. Um, so it's really an outward focus, I think, more than an in, inward one. <clears throat> sort of a marketing function too, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they can provide support, you know, with, with this notion of, of public scholarship. I mean, that was a focus that particularly towards the end of my, uh, of my term as dean, we, we started having a lot of conversations about what does public scholarship mean? Because one, one of the things I learned pretty quickly is if you ask faculty to, because we tried this, we asked them to write little research briefs, the things that we could um, 
disseminate outside the college, outside the university, they, they're, they're not very good at it. I mean, because they, they tend to still write like they write their research, which is very technical, lots of, um, lots of, of uh, jargon, right? Which, which your, your public audience is not gonna necessarily understand or they're gonna turn off. So it seemed to me that it, it, we can't ask the faculty to do that unless we, unless we teach them how to do it. Um, and if, if faculty are so inclined, there are now ways of learning how to write for a public audience. But I, I felt like the communications office could help to do some of that. So by interviewing a faculty member and, you know, and then translating it into English, you know, into common everyday parlance uh, would, be, would be a helpful thing. And so they, that is one of the functions that they do. And also uh, the strategy of focusing on graduate studies. I mean, that's graduate education. That's the key because that's, I, I think that's the right strategy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, history of strong, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's perfect. Perfect. How did yeah. you make that? I mean, I want to know how did you make up that, make your mind that we're focusing on graduate. I, I'm, I'm not sure to tell you the truth, except that it, it was, it was part of, of thinking about what is it about our college that right. should draw people? I mean, what makes us unique? Why should someone come to us and not go to University of Florida, University of South? What's, what's unique and important about us? And that seemed to be one of the ways to distinguish us because we were a strong research college. And so that meant that we, we could and were doing very strong work in graduate education. So right, it, right. Right. Natural. Right. And right now, FSU's image is top notch in this field. You know, that's, yeah. that really helps. And that's the result of that strategy at that time. I mean, that really needs some courage to make that decision because that's really, you know, that's an administrative decision. So great. And well, you, uh, you may remember the, um, the downturn in the economy around 2007, eight. 2009. Yeah. And that yeah. Eight. Well, one of the things that I don't remember who said this to me, but mm -hmm. someone said, um, don't ever waste a good crisis. Right, right. Right. And right. so in thinking about, okay, how do we not waste a good crisis? Um, mm -hmm. It's like, okay, how do we, how do we be surgical in our approach to budget cuts? I, I, I mean, I went through a, a serious, we lost, we lost 25% of our operating budget over a period of a year and a half. And you can't do that without it affecting what you do, right? And when you figure that, you know, between 80 and 90% of your operating costs are people. So then you've got to figure out, um, I, I didn't want to do death by a thousand cuts. I didn't want to just weaken everything and and because I didn't think we could recover. So that that's one of the other things that that I think played into this was in figuring out where are our strengths, how do we maintain those, and what can we let go? What are we doing now that we don't have to do that we can let go during these budget cuts? And I think that's um, that that was one of the other factors clearly that that played into this. Right. That's that's really good. I mean. That's a hard decision. I mean, that's, and also that's very big challenge to do. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I've been doing it, yeah. I'm just glad that I never had, to, it didn't happen again, you know, cause I know that right. with the pandemic, the universities are going to be hit in their, in the budget. And I know that in talking to our Dean and other uh, administrators, that they're already being asked to do um, scenarios of what happens if we have to do, a cut because, um, you know, Florida is a, I mean, we're a state that relies on tourist dollars. And with the pandemic, tourist dollars are not coming. So that means their budget's going to be less. And that means it could easily affect the university's budgets because they're public universities. And um, I'm, I'm actually working with UMass right now. I've been asked to serve on a on a board for the college I graduated from, from with my PhD. And we just um, had a board meeting and had discussion about uh, the potential impact of the pandemic on, on university budgets. So unfortunately we may be in for another 
another time similar to the recession that occurred when I was dean, and that's unfortunate. Last night, I mean, that's really something very difficult to do, but when you did it, and uh, that's really, really a kind of achievement. Last night, we, when we had the dinner, you know, several friends together, one of them is my, one of my close friends, and he is a corporate university head of American pharmaceutical company called AstraZeneca. You probably heard of it. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> So AZU, uh, AZU University, uh, he's a uh, university head. And uh, during the pandemic, I mean, begin from the beginning of the year, uh, big pharma, I mean, corporate universities, I mean, international company, global companies in China, in Shanghai, in China, in Beijing, they, they have, a, they cut a lot of people, but they didn't cut one single person. They are 90 plus people strong team a corporate university, a training department, you know, that many people, they didn't cut any, anybody. And um, so, and they're thriving. They're, they're the lead, one of the leaders in the training industry, training field in China. And the, they're, they're the top leading figures in the pharmaceutical, you know, education, you know, training, learning development field to today. So, that's, that's something that we hailed him last night and uh, what he did. So, I mean, that's kind of a similar to what you have said, your situation, very similar. And uh, so one of the things being, being an, an administrator is to get the right people on board and, uh, you know, to get the right people on the bus. And uh, you have, as Dean, you have hired more than 117 people. <laughs> for the College of Ed. So what are your cri criteria to hire the most competent of people? Well, that's, a, I don't know that there, that I could say have specific criteria, but, um, no. but certainly we're looking, um, we're looking for the best people we can, but we're also looking at the best fit with, with our programs. And so one of the things that I asked for my, my departments to do. So when we had a faculty opening, um, the de department chairs would, would work with me to develop, or they pretty much develop the, the uh, criteria for hiring, um, and they ran the searches. Um, but we talked about what, what, again, what is it about your program that would make somebody want to be a faculty member here? What are your goals? I mean, I wanted them to have directions they could communicate to any candidates that were coming. And in some cases, that also meant they were looking for sp specific types of interests in the candidates that they were, that they were attempting to recruit. And um, I don't know, and then, you know, it was a, it's a mutual, it's a mutual job, I guess, to, to, to recruit uh, good people. Um, but I, but it, it was important that people feel like they are a good fit to the organization and that we see them as, as having skills and, and, uh, and knowledge that will, that will advance our goals. I think one of the other things too, that as an administrator, you have to be willing to walk away. I mean, I had, by that I mean, I had some searches for faculty where the departments brought me a, a list of candidates and I said, uh, no, this isn't good enough. Try again. I um, mean, I had one department that uh, I had told them from the get-go that they needed to diversify their faculty. Um, they were basically all white guys, right? And that in this day and age, that's not acceptable. And they told me, this was pretty funny, actually. They told me, there aren't any women out there. I'm like, no, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't believe that. So I was traveling one time and during, during this, and I just took a few minutes before I was going out for an evening engagement, got my laptop out, and just did, I just started searching programs in their field and looking at other universities. And I just picked universities that would be comparable to FSU, highly ranked and so on. And then I made a list of all the women faculty in those programs <laughs> and, and I gave it to them and I said, I am not above stealing. You know, if that's what it takes, 
you know, right. you get a, a, a qualified woman in your program that we recruit somebody who's already in another university, well then let's do it. But don't tell me there aren't any women out there because here's a list. Right, right. So that, that was also actually a, another strategy that I routinely used was to tell the faculty, your committee is a search committee. It's not just a selection committee, it's a search committee. So I want you out there, don't just put an ad out and see who applies. Figure out who it is you really want and let's go after those people. And so, so sometimes, for example, we would invite somebody, particularly at a higher rank, you know, where you wouldn't necessarily, that person's not looking to leave where they currently are, let's invite them in. Get, give them a chance to get to know us a little bit, for us to get to know them a little bit, to show them how they could do well with us, better with us than they could at their current location. And that was successful in a, in a number of hires where you, you really target the people that you want and go after them. You know, don't just, don't just wait. Right, right. The reason I'm asking this question is because not only we want to, we want to learn from you the way that you hire the most, get the right people on the bus because we're, our audience, uh, our audience are the young, most of them are young learning mm -hmm. Professionals and Chinese society is more kind of a hierarchical, you know, yes. respect to the seniorities and the rankings and at the corporate universe. I mean, at the corporate. So for the for the for the young people, of course, they have their own set of views, uh, structures in or uh, for organizations. But it's really looking for what you know, not who you know. Uh, right. What you know is more important, and uh, and then. And then the people who need your capabilities, your your set of um, uh, skills and skill sets, they will come after you. So, um, so learn. I mean, there's no other way to no other way up to climb to climb the the ladder. You know, really. Well, and that one way. of the things that that I mean, I've always taken the attitude that any candidate that I'm interviewing is interviewing mm -hmm. us, and so. If they don't ask questions like they're interviewing us, well, then I'm not so certain they're that interested in us. Or they, if they don't know anything about us, they haven't done their homework, and if they don't ask the questions, well, maybe they're not going to be such a good fit after all. Exactly, exactly. And uh, Marcy, you mentioned that when you joined, you are, the, you are so many the first women uh, female uh, educator, a professor, and the dean. And so many first. So and they're all guys, 30 guys, one woman, one woman. So in Chinese, where we have a saying, they're all green leaves, but one rose in the middle. <laughs> yep, that was me. <laughs> yeah. So how did you survive? My question is, you know, we had, uh, I mean, at FSU, there are so many great names, milestone names, like Bob Gane. Uh, like uh, Bob Morgan, uh, Leslie Briggs, Walter Wagner, uh, Walter Dick, Roger Kaufman, yeah. Bob Branson, Bob Wieser, John Keller. Gosh, the names are just, the, I mean, the name list, are, each one of them is a legend. So college, I mean, as a college team, what did you do to maintain those? What are the most important thing what you have done or you, you should, I mean, the College of Ed should do in the future to may, maintain these legacies? Uh, that's a great question. And um, I don't know that I have a great answer, but um, I, one of the things that I did as a dean that, and it was a personal thing, it wasn't just because I was dean, but I didn't want the college to forget Bob Gagne's name. Um, he had passed away by then, by the time I did this, but um, I, he, he is probably the most well-known uh, person that has ever served in our college. Um, he was president of AERA. He was, um, I mean, he had many, many accolades and his work was well, well-known, well-regarded. And so, and, and he was a great colleague. I mean, I, I have to say he was great fun to work with. He and I actually had the lovely opportunity to teach a class together. Um, and we were, we are so different in personality, but somehow it worked and it was just, it was fun. And we, and we, we um, published a book together. I mean, it was just fun. So I established um, um, a fund 
an endowed fund in Bob's name that is, it's called the Robert M. Gagne Research Award. Um, and the fund the, supports a, a prize, a research prize. So to the best research conducted by a graduate student and the best research conducted by a faculty member each year. And so a committee um, determines the winners each year. Um, they solicit nominations of articles and research that the graduate students have done and that faculty have done. And then it's competitive and it's selected by a faculty committee. And then we honor the, the recipients at, a, um, at an annual uh, research symposium that we host each year. And so, and I, I preside and so I, I give the award and, but it's, a, it's just a way of reminding people who he was and what he, what he contributed to our college and, and to the field. I wish we could do that with all of them. I mean, we, we, we do have, um, um, and, I, and I've done this as well, have named professors. Um, so we have a, a named professor program that, um, so like Jim Klein is the Walter Dick professor. Mm -hmm. And so that was an honor that was bestowed on him when we hired him. Um, so I, I would like I would like to see that happen either a scholarship name for them or a, you know something that is that keeps their name in perpetuity. Um, but we haven't managed it with with all of them yet, um, and we should, and we should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And also research wise, there uh, there there must be a mechanism in place that uh, to continue or develop or escalate what they have already you know done in the in the field of psychology in the, in the field of ISD and so on and so forth yeah yeah exactly. so yeah okay so the, uh, because th this uh, this question is sort of uh, very important because uh because that's where we want to we want to <laughs> go after we want to follow that's the FSU so right. anyway uh coming up uh coming to the uh last set of questions of course, I have gazillions of questions, but I do have to respect your time. Uh, if you had a chance to start all over again, what would you have done differently? You know, I, when I saw that question, I, I puzzled over it a little bit because I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would have done anything differently. Um, I, you know, I've I've made decisions in in my career that um, that. You know, they, I don't, I didn't always know how they would turn out, but they turned out pretty well. And uh, I don't know that I would have done anything differently. I, mm -hmm. I credit a number of things, you know, where I went to college, the mentoring that I had as a graduate student, um, mm -hmm. living overseas, that, right. that changed my perspective enormously. Having some opportunity to work in business before I went back into uh, academia. I think that was critical because I, I didn't really think I wanted to be a faculty member. You know, I, I like to teach, but research, who did research, right? But, um, but all of those things ultimately um, worked out and, uh, and I've, had a, I've had a great career and right. great colleagues. I mean, I've had, I could not ask for a better group of people to work with that I've had and uh, all throughout in the program. And then those people that I've worked, my fellow deans when I was a dean, it's FSU has been a great, great spot for me. So, um, so yeah, I, I can't think of anything that I would have done any differently. And a very successful one as well. I suppose, okay, so if I have to say something. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, please. So, well, I'll, I will tell you the advice I give to young faculty that, that, I, that I never followed myself, okay? Um, and that is, but, but I, think, I think circumstances have changed a little bit. I, I was always a bit of a, um, a dil, I will say a dilettante in the sense that too many things interest me. And mm. so I found it difficult to concentrate or focus research in a, in a particular way. Um, and, and all, but I think as I've reflected on the reason for that is I think I'm a trans, I think of myself as a trans, translationalist. 
in the sense of I've always wanted to translate research into practice. That's, that's, that's my strength. And as an administrator, you have to be able to translate research into policy and you have to be able to translate research into um, um, you know, public, to be able to have an impact on public. So I think that's been my strength. But I do see that for young faculty, the importance of really focusing on a couple, no more than three primary areas of research, because that's where you're going to have your biggest impact on research. I don't think my impact is, is great in the area of research. My book has had an impact, but that's because it's used in training and in, in education, not because it's, um, I mean, and, and what I'm doing is simply translating the research of others into, into something that makes, that, that will have an impact on practice. But I think to have, a, to have a really strong impact in sort of basic knowledge generation, you really have to focus research in, in more narrowly than I, than I was ever able to do in my career. So. As a closing statement, do you have any advice to the young practitioners, learning development practitioners in China and developing countries as a whole? Um, um, I would say my advice is to uh, network and to learn. You know, always be open to new opportunities because you, you never know when, when an opportunity is going to come your way that might look out of the ordinary, but in fact might be just the ticket to, to advancement and or to satisfying your particular interests and, and goals. Um, and, and I think that networking is key. So the kind of work that you're doing with this series, I mean, it's just lovely. It's really, a, I just can imagine how, how, what an impact that will have. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mercy. It's, yeah, been, uh, it's been a good nearly two hours. <laughs> and, uh, really, <laughs> it has been. Uh, I just feel like we just feel like we just started, right? <laughs> I haven't been paying attention to the time. It's been, it's been great fun having a conversation with you. It's really uh, very, very Thank you. Fun. Thank you. It is fun to me as well. And I've learned a lot. Thank you. And also on behalf of all our viewers in, uh, in front of the screen, thank you so much, Marcy. I and uh, I look forward to seeing you. Um, maybe after the pandemic and next time when we, I, I, I made a promise to Roger that next time I'll come over, but <laughs> well, he passed away, but uh, well, I still have a lot of friends to visit at FSU. And uh, of course, Jen, yeah, still by the house and you know, everything. Anyway, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so take care and stay safe. You as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. That's my interview with Dr. Marcy Driscoll. How do you like it? I really enjoy talking to her. Our interview was fairly long, but I didn't really feel it. During our interview, we covered a lot of topics, especially on ISD and on psychology of learning. And uh, we talk about what will define instructional design in the future, how instructional design should embrace technology, and why. ISD should be interdisciplinary and the social elements of instructional system design. And also in the era of WUCA, how are we going to develop comprehensive talents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also at the very end, she gave us a lot of gave the uh, young practitioners of very good advices. And before that, we also I also asked her how she did it as a trailblazer being in that post for 13 years as a Dean of College of Education, how she carried on, successfully carried on the legacies, the tradition, and make it a great program in the nation and throughout the world. So we learned a lot. Thank you, Dr. Marcy Driscoll. Thank you all for your, all these years, decades of contribution. And thank you for talking, sharing with us we look forward to hearing from you more and happy retirement. Enjoy your time. Next week, we are going to have the very honor to invite another very heavyweight figure 
in our field. Her name is Dr. Karen Watkins. Dr. Karen Watkins is the department chair of, uh, of uh, University of Georgia. And uh, she's been there for a long time through decades of research. Her strength of research is her focus is in uh, organizational learning, uh, is in learning organizations and lear uh, organizational development. And she has published a couple of books. And uh, so next week, we are gonna ask her a lot of questions about what is HRD? What is it composed of? What is the relationship between HRD and organizational development? What does OD do? And also, what is a learning organization? Does it, is there a standard for learning organizations? We'll see. So until next week, we will learn a lot. So before, be, be, before I let, I let you go, I just wanna add a few more, few more words that uh, Dr. Karen Watkins used to be the president of AHRD between 1994 to 1996. And she was also inducted the International Adult and Continuation Education Hall of Fame in 2003. So she's quite an important figure in our field. So we're looking forward to talking to her next week, but until next Wednesday, please stay tuned, stay safe. Thank you and good night.